Bob, and it's a pleasure for me to be here and talk about the most exciting area in San Diego, the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District and the Gas Lamp Quarter. So today we're going to be talking about not only the wonderful women of this district, but we're also going to highlight many of the 93 historic buildings. Now these buildings hold the stories of the women who lived in the district. And let's put up the next slide. So today, this restored area of 93 historic buildings holds the stories of the women who lived in the district, those who helped others living in this area, women who tried to clean up the area, and those who enriched and preserved the district. The following stories belong to those women who left their mark on this area of architectural jewels. Next slide. So we're going to start by talking about Old Town. Now this particular area of San Diego and of California was inhabited by the Kumeyaay people for tens of thousands of years. Now Old Town, which has been the center of San Diego dating back to the 1840s, consisted of about 998 inhabitants, and that included Mexicans, it included Native Americans, and about 200 settlers. Now, this particular area uh, was challenged. Uh, first of all, there was a desire to move the center of San Diego down to San Diego Bay and not to have it be located near Mission Valley or near the Presidio Fort. So the first attempt was in 1850, after California received its statehood, and the second attempt was in 1888. So let's have the next slide. So this shows a little bit of the activity as San Diego expanded a little bit from that 798 population of early San Diego. Okay, next slide. Now, Chinese immigrants came to San Diego primarily through San Francisco's Chinatown. And thousands of Chinese came. They came to avoid the problems in China. There was a huge famine and they came here to mine for gold during the 1840s. Then in 1863 to 1869, they were employed to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. Now they also came to San Diego, next slide but they were restricted to stay in a certain part of San Diego. And this included an eight block area of San Diego's Chinatown. And that also included some of the stingery and part of the gas lamp quarter area. Next slide. Now the Chinese workers who came to San Diego primarily started as fishermen and they provided San Diego's uh, population with abalone and all types of fish. But when the railroad was to be extended from National City to San Bernardino, more workers were needed. So 800 Chinese workers were brought to this area to work on that railroad from National City to San Bernardino. Next. Now we're standing at the beginning of Chinatown and there are two beautiful six foot high welcoming lions to this area. And this particular area is 
right next to the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. Next slide. And as we can see, this beautiful building has been here at this location since the 1980s. So next slide. Now this particular building was actually the Chinese Mission School. And this particular building was built in 1927 on land owned by George Marston. And it also included an 18 room dormitory. So many of the Chinese immigrants who were studying at the mission school had a place to stay. Now this particular school, the Chinese mission school was headed by Martha, I'm sorry, Margaret Fanton. And she became known as a mother of Chinatown. And she went into the hovels and the shacks of Chinatown to see how the inhabitants were doing. And she also taught Sunday school and she taught English classes and helped these Chinese immigrants become more acclimated to San Diego. In 1925, she went to China and she brought news to the people living there from their relatives who lived back in San Diego's Chinatown. And when she returned, she resumed her work as the unofficial social worker of Chinatown. And this was before uh, social work became a profession and she was the first here in San Diego's Chinatown. Now she did raise money to create this Chinese museum school and she did retire uh, in 1935, but she did continue to help the Chinese immigrants with their particular endeavors. Next slide. Now, during the renovation of this area back in the 1970s and 1980s, there was considerable concern about the demolition of many of these Chinese historic buildings, in particular, the Chinese Mission School. And Dorothy Hom and Sally Wong Avery really took on this cause, along with Dorothy's husband, Tom Hom. And they were determined to save as many of these historic buildings as they could, and primarily the Chinese Mission School. And they were able to save it. They jacked up this building onto a flatbed and brought it to 404 uh, 3rd Avenue, where it became the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. So we have Dorothy Hom, Tom Hom, and Sally Wong Avery to thank for their efforts in saving this particular building from demolition. And they also saved almost 20 buildings during that demolition period. Next slide. Now, next to the uh, San Diego Historical, Chinese Historical Museum is a beautiful gate, the Dr. Sun Yet Sun Gate, which uh, leads to the most welcoming park in this area. And across the street is an addition to the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, and that's the Dr. Sun Yet Sen addition to the museum and it has three galleries there and welcoming us to this beautiful, beautiful building is the first emperor of China. And currently there's an amazing exhibit on the history of acupuncture. Next slide. Now, as you can see here, we do have an, another photo of the Chinese Historical Museum where the tour begins of this area. Next slide. 
Now, as I mentioned, Sally Wong Avery was instrumental in working in this area, preserving buildings, enriching the whole area, but she became very involved in the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and she headed up the service center there for many years. She also re received her JD from California, I'm sorry, Law Center. Cal Western. Cal Western, I'm sorry. And uh, also served in that capacity. Her foundation recently donated $10 million to UC San Diego, and she has formed a very special uh, library that will concentrate on Chinese artifacts and the history of China as far as San Diego goes. Next slide. The head of the um, San Diego Chinese Historical Museum Board of Directors is Dr. Lily Chang. And she uh, came to San Diego and completed her PhD work and started teaching. She founded um, several particular organizations and worked very hard at, um, at really promoting the museum. She also is um, the founder of the Chinese Cultural Center at San Diego State University. And that is the most gorgeous uh, part of San Diego State University campus. She presided as chair of the International Affairs Board of Directors of the, for the city of San Diego and chair of the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District also for the city of San Diego. She grew up in Shanghai and um, I'm sorry, she grew up in Taiwan after being born in Shanghai. She entered graduate school in the United States in 1969 and began teaching after graduating. So under her leadership, the museum provides exhibitions and ongoing educational programs to share this rich Chinese cultural heritage with San Diego's diverse communities. Next slide. Now, next door to the museum is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, or CCBA. And back in 1911, it was sort of a, a spot for a radical group that was really working to create a revolution in China. And apparently, they were quite successful. And in 1912, it was taken over by the Chinese Cultural I mean, Consolidated Benevolent Association to provide social services for Chinese immigrants. Now, this particular building also hosts the Lunar New Year every year right outside on the street uh, to celebrate this very special event for the community. Next slide. By the way, Sally Wong Avery was the first woman president of the CCBA. Now, Cindy uh, Quinn Sue uh, is a great granddaughter of Ah Quinn and Sue Quinn, who are the mother and father of San Diego's Chinatown. Now, she grew up uh, being really curious about her ancestors. As I said, she is a great granddaughter of Ah Quinn and Sue Quinn and has dedicated her life to working on this particular issue. Her father actually helped restore one of the buildings back in the 1940s. Now she uh, has been also a, a an analyst for the federal government, and she worked in that capacity for 38 years. Next slide. Now the Quinn Produce Building is across the street from the museum, and this was where Ah Quinn uh, 
sold many of his uh, products that he grew on various lands that he either leased or owned somehow, even though Chinese were not allowed to own land. But this was the produce building from which many of the products were sold. And it was brought to this particular area on a flatbed brought by four horses and put up here at 431 Third Avenue. It's been here and owned by the Quinn family ever since. Okay, next slide. As I said, Ah Quinn was quite the promoter. He owned a real estate. I'm not sure how he managed to do that, probably through his children who were natural born citizens of this country. And he also um, was very interested in developing various pieces of real estate. Next slide. Now his wife, Asu Leon Quinn, came to the United States in 1878 when she was 16 years old. She worked for four months uh, in a private home. She was pretty much enslaved and she was finally rescued and brought to the Presbyterian home that was led by Superintendent Margaret Culbertson. Now, Asu lived at the home for 30 months. And during that time, she learned English. She learned how to cook and sew. She learned all about Christianity, too. And she eventually was baptized. In, in 1881, she married uh, Quinn, and they moved back to San Diego, where he was living and he was supervising that expansion of the railroad from National City to San Bernardino. They lived in the area and uh, had 12 children, all of whom became quite successful and followed up on many of the different occupations that uh, Quinn held, including uh, continuing to support the Quinn Produce Building. Next slide. Here's a picture of the Quinn family. And as you can see, 12 beautiful children. And only one child did not survive to adulthood and that was little McKinley. Next slide. Now, what was interesting about Asu was she was asked by Walter Mellon to really clean up the gas lamp area and the Chinatown area. So she was entrusted to talk with the different people who lived in Chinatown to help them figure out how to clean up their homes and what what particular shacks or hovels should be destroyed during this major cleanup starting in 1911. So she worked with the health department on this endeavor. Now, one of the areas that was in desperate need of being cleaned up were the compounds of brothels throughout the Stingery area of the red light district in this particular area of San Diego. And one of these areas was called the Wildcat Alley and it consisted of about 20 little cribs or stalls. And this is where prostitutes worked. Now there was a major cleanup uh, starting in 1912, next slide. And one of the women involved in this particular cleanup was Dr. Charlotte Baker. And she and her husband, Dr. Fred Baker, came to San Diego in 1888. Can you imagine this town of 16,000 people welcome two doctors to San Diego? And Dr. Charlotte Baker worked with the vice of uh, Department of Law Enforcement to clean up this area. And her major concern was the elimination of venereal diseases in this area. 
But there was also a group of women, the Purity League from one of the local churches who also worked on this project. And they wanted to clean up this area before the big exposition in Balboa Park in 1915. So this whole area was to be cleaned up and purified before people arrive through the new Panama Canal uh, to disembark here at the foot of Broadway and go to Balboa Park to celebrate the new park here in our city. Now, Dr. Charlotte Baker was quite accomplished. She led the San Diego Women's Suffrage Association. She was president. She wanted women to vote. And she and her cadre of women would just pursue men who could vote to insist that they vote for women's suffrage. She also was quite the doctor. She delivered more than a thousand babies without the loss of a mother. And this was unheard of during that era when the second leading cause of death for childbearing women was childbirth or complications of pregnancy. She headed the San Diego County Medical Society, the first woman and one of the many first women ever to head up the Medical Society. She also headed the Civil Service Commission and was an honorary president of the YWCA. Thank you very much, Dr. Charlotte Baker, for your contributions to really saving San Diego. And she was a very staunch supporter of the um, Temperance Union also. Next slide. Now, other parts of Chinatown on Third Avenue include the new and the historic. So we have the CCBA sen Senior Garden, a beautiful residence for senior citizens that was built in 1999, beautiful apartment building. And next to that particular building is the site where the Wu Chi Chang Company had resided. Now that particular store was open for almost a century. It, it expanded into three different locations and uh, provided oriental goods and services and people could come and visit and hang out at this place and then the other locations throughout San Diego. Next slide. Other historic buildings include the Ying An Labor and Merchants Association, another beautiful building on Third Avenue. And we also were honored in this particular area to have created by our city, the Tom Hom Honorary Avenue. And what a delight it was to celebrate that opening of that, that area here on Third Avenue. Next slide. Other parts of Chinatown move on to Fourth Avenue, and we have the Quinn Building and the Casa de Tomas edition, and those were both built by Tom Quinn, the son of uh, Quinn. And farther up the street was the uh, location of a Chinese herbalist that later became the Royal Pie Bakery. And upstairs was a notorious brothel that was finally shut down in 1935. Next slide. Perhaps one of the most gorgeous buildings in all of San Diego is the Horton Grand Hotel. And this was created by Dan Pearson. And he claims that he tore down uh, two buildings and reassembled them to create the Horton Grand Hotel. And that actually became one of the first sites of the Chinese Historical Museum and Tea Room. He set aside a room just for that purpose. And one of the uh, people who lived at the Brooklyn Hotel, the other end of this complex, 
was Wyatt Earp and his wife, Josie, even though they were not officially married. He refereed boxing matches and owned saloons, and they finally moved to Hollywood where she urged the creation of a movie called Feel Marshall, which was a story of Wyatt Earp. Next slide. Now, in addition to Josie Earp, there were three women who were considered infamous. They ran the three upscale brothels in the San Diego, Chinatown, well, primarily the gas lamp quarter. And one of those was Madame Ida Bailey's uh, Canary Cottage, which um, was at the end of this alley. Next slide. Another a madam was a madam, maybe Goldstein, and she had the turf club and she did something unique. She hired the organist from the um, Lutheran church to provide music for the gentleman who came to the turf club. And the third madam was Madame Carrera who had the Golden Poppy Hotel on Fifth Avenue. Next slide. Well, one of the most uh, beautiful buildings, and it's the oldest building in the gas lamp quarter, is the Davis Horton House or the Gas Lamp Museum. And this particular building came about primarily because of Maria de Jesus Estudillo. Next slide. Now, Maria was married to William Heath Davis, and he was a very successful developer in San Francisco, but she wanted to move from San Francisco back to San Diego. And her uncle had a home in Old Town and it was called Casa Estudillo, which is pictured here. So she wanted her husband to relocate to San Diego and he decided he thought it would be a great idea to develop a new part of San Diego. And he thought being near San Diego Bay was where the city should be. So he purchased land, he created, uh, he created um, a place for ships to land so they could uh, enjoy this new development. But unfortunately, even though he even brought some prefabricated houses from San Francisco to San Diego, the whole thing by 1853 had pretty much fizzled out. And uh, his development was called Rabbitsville because the rabbits took over again, or it was called Davis's Folly. Next slide. Now this shows you one of the pictures of one of those prefabricated houses. And as I mentioned, uh, downtown San Diego was, was really started by William Heath Davis in 1850. But then again, after that failed, it was again pursued by Alonzo Horton in 1867. Now he bought uh, land, about 800 acres, and he paid $265 for that whole parcel. And he divided everything into small lots, so there'd be a lot of corner lots. He gave, or he sold a park area to the city for $10,000. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Horton Plaza Park a little bit later. Now, his venture was very, very successful, and it created a wonderful gas lamp order area and also uh, added to the Little Italy area and also Chinatown. Okay, next slide. Now, the Davis Horton House was actually one of those prefabricated houses and the city found this house back in the early 1980s and they bought it and moved it to this location. So this Davis Horton house is the oldest house in the gas lamp quarter. 
and it has a most wonderful park next to it. And in that park are two statues of dogs. One is Gaslam Bum, and he was sort of the mascot of the Gaslam Quarter. And he would roam from bar to bar and attend all the celebrations. And our sister city, Edinburgh, had come, some of the members of that organization had come to San Diego and they saw Gas Lamp Bomb and they wanted to add to that their own Edinburgh Bobby. So they sent this little statue of Bobby who's sitting on that bench. So we have Bum who's lying down and uh, Edinburgh Bobby sitting on the bench, welcoming people to this little park next to the Davis Horton House or Gas Lamp Museum. Next slide. Now I mentioned that there were women who helped people living in this area and they came out of the Helping Hands Home Mission. But one woman in particular, Anna Shepper, had her own prefabricated house and she actually ran the San Diego County Hospital, even though she had no medical training, but she offered beds to men in need for a dollar a night. And so she was the originator of the San Diego County Hospital. But here at the Helping Hands Home Mission at the Grand Pacific Hotel, was where Miss Johnson, who was a missionary, and Agnes God Dodson actually ran the first children's hospital in San Diego. And it, they operated this facility for just about 20 years, from 1900 to just about 1920, the first San Diego children's hospital. Next slide. Now, here we are in the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District. And that's really divided into three distinct areas. One titled Chinatown, and we can see two buildings here that represent uh, that influence. And the next slide, and this shows Japantown. And the Island Hotel and the Callan Hotel were both places where Japanese workers were welcome to live. Next slide. And then there was also the Filipino Quarter. And there was the Manila Cafe and also the Lincoln Hotel, both of which still exist. And at the Lincoln Hotel is the Philippine Library and Museum. And this particular building during World War II was used to house Japanese Americans who were being sent to internment camps. And so they stayed at the Lincoln Hotel until they were ready to be shipped off. Next slide. The street farther is the old city hall. And this particular building was built in 1874, the first two floors of it. And in 1891, the next two floors were added. So this four-story building, and it's just beautiful. And this was the place where our city library was housed for many years. And this particular building took care of all of our offices for the city. And Lydia Knapp Horton, who came to San Diego in the 1860s with her husband, William Knapp, uh, was very concerned about the issue of why there was no building for a library. Next slide. Now she did pursue this dream of hers to have its own library here in San Diego. And she sent a letter to William Carnegie and asked him if there was a possibility he could build a library here in San Diego. And he said, of course, and he sent $50,000 for it and just encouraged her to have the city donate the land, which the city did. He also donated $10,000 for stacks for the books. And so this library was our public library for many years until it was torn down for another building. Next slide. 
Another activist in our community was Anna Gunn Marston. She came to San Diego in 1875 and, and all she could say was, wow, this place is barely a village. But during uh, her time here in San Diego, she met George Marston and they married and he started the development of his department stores beginning in 1881. But he was very dedicated to the Chinese community. And he was the one who donated the land for the Chinese mission school and its nearby dormitory. Next slide. Now, Fanny Keating wanted to honor her husband. So she built this beautiful building in the gas lamp quarter in 1890 and it still stands. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous building and it housed the, the Croce restaurant, which was very popular during the 1980s, 1990s and 2000s until the Croce restaurant moved to another area. Next slide. Two other uh, buildings are important. Also, the Nesmith Greeley Building, which was built by um, banker Nesmith, and his daughter was quite feisty, and she believed in women's right to vote. She also was concerned about uh, other issues related to women's rights, and she ended up marrying a gentleman who fought in the Civil War. Adolphus Greeley, and in 1881, he went on an expedition to the Arctic Circle, and he had 26 men with him on the ship. Well, they didn't return. So Henrietta pestered uh, William Todd Lincoln, who was Secretary of War, and said, you have to rescue my husband and the crew. Well, it wasn't something that was on the top of uh, Todd Lincoln's endeavors. And it wasn't until 1884 until a ship was finally sent to the Arctic Circle. And Adolphus Greeley and six of his crew members were still alive. They were returned to the US and he was given the Medal of Honor in 1935. And she continued her work, working for women's rights. Next slide. Two other outstanding women in the gas lamp corridor included Clara Shortridge Foles. And she uh, grew up in Iowa. She had three years of education and she became a school teacher at the age of 13. At the age of 15, she eloped and moved to Oregon with her husband. He was not a very good breadwinner and she ended up being a seamstress and provided for her family. He determined that maybe San Jose would be a better place for him to find a job. So they moved to San Jose. Unfortunately, he decided that um, he was still in love with his, the woman he met in Oregon. So he left. Clara Shortridge Fultz with five children, and he returned to Oregon. Well, Clara was quite the orator, and she became known as Portia of the Pacific, and she spoke out and managed to support her family through her speaking. But she loved the law, and she started working for a judge, and she applied to the Hastings School of Law. And the Hastings School of Law said, sorry, no women allowed. Well, Clara was outraged. She sued Hastings School of Law and went to the California Supreme Court and she won. And the, the court said, Hastings, you must allow women. Well, this was in 1879. Well, Clara had passed the bar in 1878. So she wasn't about to go to law school. And she said, I would like to practice law. And the California law said, sorry, only white males can practice law in California. And she and her colleague, Laura DeForest Gordon, went to Sacramento and they created the Woman Attorneys Act, 
which was passed by both uh, the Senate and the Assembly. And the governor debated whether or not to sign it, but he signed it. So the law was changed that any person who passes the bar in California can practice law. She was our first California woman attorney and the first woman attorney here in San Diego. She had her office at the uh, Nesmith Greeley building and she also had the San Diego Bee. And then when she was 81 years old, she ran in the gubernatorial race, the primary as a Republican. She received a pretty substantial number of votes, but not enough to win the primary. Another dedicated woman was Helen Hunt Jackson, and she wrote the book Ramona. And her particular issue was the horrible way that African American, I'm sorry, that American natives were treated. And she was assigned by the Department of the Interior to come to Temecula and live there and try to figure out, well, how horrible was the treatment of the Temecula Indians and other Indians in that particular region. So she lived with uh, William and Ramona Wolf while she lived in Temecula and studied the ill treatment of Native Americans. Now she was determined that the United States would be more receptive to cleaning up the way they were treating Native Americans. So she did write a book, which was not a bestseller. And then she thought, well, if I write a love story and include my beliefs about the ill treatment of Native Americans, maybe my message will get across. Well, she wrote the book Ramona and it was primarily based on, on Ramona Wolf, the woman where she lived with um, Ramona's husband. And Ramona Wolf was half Indian. So this story, Ramona, became a huge publishing success. Everybody was reading the book Ramona. Well, Ramona Wolf's husband died and she had to come to San Diego and she lived in the gas lamp quarter while she was dealing with how to deal with the courts in getting her share of her husband's estate. So that's the story of Ramona and how it impacted our particular area. And you know, every summer there is a special tribute to Ramona up in Hemet, special showing of the story of Ramona. Next slide. And finally, we come to the Horton Plaza Park at the end of the gas lamp quarter. And this was the park that Alonzo Horton sold to the city for $10,000. He and his wife lived on $100 a month until it was paid off. And then his wife had to go to work. Now, an, an exciting part of the Horton Plaza Park was that there was an open area for people to speak out and protest. Well, law enforcement was determined to shut it down. But in the meantime, Emma Goldman and her colleague came to San Diego and she was going to speak out in favor of the international workers of the world, the Wobblies. Well, she and uh, her companion were staying at the U.S. Grand Hotel. The head of our law enforcement came and spoke to Emma and said, it's too dangerous. We don't want you speaking at the park. We really don't. So she was encouraged to leave town. In the meantime, her boyfriend was picked up by vigilantes and driven to Oceanside where he was tortured and left stranded. Well, interestingly enough, they came back the following year and they were determined to have another protest. And again, the chief of police took them over to the train station and urged them to leave town. Well, we've now completed the walking tour and this, this little tour uh, virtually 
uh, of the gas lamp quarter and Chinatown. So we'll show the final slide. And we'll just wrap up by talking briefly about those wonderful women leaders of social movements, including Dr. Charlotte Baker. Oh, she was in the forefront of women getting the right to vote and of cleaning up of the uh, stingery area of the gas lamp area. I also talked about Clara Shortridge Foles, who was also pushing for women getting the right to vote. And she too thought it was important for women to volunteer to run for public office. And she ran as a gubernatorial candidate. Helen Hunt Jackson was determined to help the Native Americans in our country and stop their lands from being confiscated by our government. Lydia Knapp Horton was a believer in the women's club movement and also in the importance of a public library. And Anna, Anna Gunn Marston was very much a promoter of the rights for uh, different religious beliefs, and she was supporting missionaries working on behalf of various countries. And Emma Goldman was pushing for the Wobblies, the international workers of the world. Now we had staunch preservationists, Dorothy Hom in particular, Lily Chang, Sally Wong Avery, Cindy Quinn Su, and Asu uh, Quinn. There were also those wonderful social workers, Anna Shepper, who had the first San Diego County Hospital, Miss Johnson and Agnes Dodson, who also operated the first children's hospital here in San Diego. And then we had those wonderful superintendents of the Chinese Mission School, Mother Margaret Fanton and Mother Delia Reinbold. And there were also those infamous women, Madam Ida Bailey, Madam Mamie Goldstein, and Madam Corera. So it's been a wonderful experience exploring this area of architectural jewels and the stories of these phenomenal women of our community. Thank you for joining the tour.